Welcome back to Virtual Space TV 3D Show. I am Amanda Bush. After an unfortunately long delay due to technical difficulties, I hope to resume bringing you regular reports on exciting new developments in space. One of the big stories since our last program was the first rocket-powered flight of the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 space plane. On April 29th the Spaceship 2 Enterprise, as it is named, was carried beneath the White Knight 2 aircraft to an altitude of over 14 kilometers and released. After dropping for a few seconds, the Spaceship 2's hybrid rocket motor roared to life and the vehicle zoomed across the sky. Its bright plume visible to spectators on the ground at the Mojave Air and Space Port near Los Angeles, California. The rocket fired for 16 seconds and the vehicle reached Mach 1.2, breaking the sound barrier. It flew to an altitude of about 17 kilometers. The Enterprise had flown several glide flights in the past couple of years but this was the first time it had fired its rocket. The plan is to gradually increase the duration of the rocket firings over a series of test flights. If all goes well, the Enterprise will cross the threshold of space at 100 kilometers by the end of the year. Richard Branson, the founder of the project, hopes to fly to space with members of his family on Christmas Day. Nearly 600 people have purchased flights from Virgin Galactic. The company hopes to begin flying the first commercial passengers in early 2014. Currently the cost of a ticket is $200,000. Hurry and get your ticket soon, though. The prices are going up to $250,000. Today we achieved a huge milestone for the company, which was that we broke the speed of sound and we had our first powered flight, and uh, the team is just incredibly jazzed. We are now off to the races in terms of powered flight. So this was the first powered flight. We'll have um, a few more this year as we extend the burn times and as we approach uh, our first space flight. And then what comes after that is commercial service. And now we'll be ramping up the building of spaceships, we'll be ramping up the building of motherships, we'll be ramping up the building of rockets. It's going to be the start of a you know, whole new era of space travel. It's going to be tremendously exciting. Everything's possible, I think, after today. Since it landed in Gale Crater on Mars last August, the Curiosity rover has been diligently exploring the crater floor and has found many interesting things. It found three areas, for example, that appeared very similar to old stream beds on Earth. Further analysis of the small gravel rocks seen in those areas has now confirmed that those places are indeed remnants of an ancient stream. Furthermore, NASA researchers say that the rocks, which vary in size from that of sand particles to golf balls, enable them to calculate the depth and speed of the water that once flowed over them. It appears that a stream flowed over the rocks at about a meter per second, a walking pace, and the stream was of a depth that ranged from ankle to hip deep. The rounding of the rocks indicates that the water flowed over a long period, not just during a brief flood. The rocks were carried for at least a few kilometers. So how did this pebble deposit get to be here? If we look more broadly in Gale Crater, we can see that there is a prominent feature that geologists call an alluvial fan. Alluvial fans are cone-shaped deposits of gravel and sand that accumulate where streams exit mountains. In Gale Crater, there is a 10-kilometer long fan formed at the mouth of a 30-meter deep canyon that is derived from the crater rim. On the fan itself, we can see evidence for multiple channels suggesting that the stream bed direction changed through time. When we look at the location of the Curiosity landing site with respect to the alluvial fan, we see that the rover landed downstream of the fan. The rounded pebbles likely represent long-distance transport down the alluvial fan. So this is really exciting news for the science team because it's the first time we are seeing gravel transported by water on the surface of Mars. 
The atmosphere on Mars is far too thin today to keep liquid water from quickly evaporating. So the Martian air must long ago have been much thicker than it is today to allow for such streams. Back in November, we reported on the vertical takeoff and landing test of the SpaceX Grasshopper, a prototype reusable rocket booster. That flight reached just 10 meters off the ground. Since then the Grasshopper has flown three times at the company's test site in McGregor, Texas, each time going higher than the previous flight. In the latest flight in April, the 10-story tall Grasshopper reached 250 meters and stayed in the air for over a minute despite a stiff wind. In May the company announced that they will begin testing the vehicle at Spaceport America in New Mexico next fall. At that site they can go to much higher altitudes than they are allowed to go at the McGregor location. The goal of the program is to develop a fully reusable launch system in which the first and second stages of the rocket return to the launch pad, where they will be reassembled and prepared for another launch. If they can do this quickly, it will drastically reduce the cost of getting to space. Only about 0.3% of the cost of a launch is due to the propellants. The rest is due to throwing away the rocket each time. In addition to the grasshopper tests, during upcoming satellite launches the first stage booster will separate normally but then refire its engine and come down to the water to do a simulated vertical landing. SpaceX plans to test this on several launches. When it is perfected, they will fly the booster back to the pad instead of into the water. They hope to accomplish this in 2014. It will take a few more years to develop a reusable second stage. However, the first stage booster represents about three quarters of the cost of a launch. If they can reuse it even a few times, that will reduce the average cost of a launch significantly. Planetary Resources announced in 2012 that they were planning to carry out a long-range program to mine asteroids' valuable materials such as platinum by the 2020s. Their first step is to put several space telescopes into orbit and use them to look for near-Earth asteroids that might contain such materials. They will later send probes to those asteroids that look promising for close-up examination. The company attracted enormous public interest after its debut and many people have asked to get involved with their activities in some way. Recently the company unveiled an outreach project that would give students, schools, and members of the general public an opportunity to use one of their ARKIT space telescopes to observe celestial objects of their choice. There are robotic observatories on Earth that provide this sort of public access but this would be the first space observatory to offer it. To fund the project, the company opened a Kickstarter campaign with the goal of collecting $1 million in 32 days. Many commentators thought this was far too ambitious. The most any previous space-related project has raised via crowdfunding was about $100,000. Surprisingly, the Planetary Society Arcade campaign has raised over $750,000 in just the first week. One popular perk is what they call the space selfie. For $25, a screen on the outside of the telescope will display an image from you such as a portrait shot. A camera will take a picture of this with the Earth in the background. This cheap way to put yourself into orbit seems to be very popular. Hope to see you in space soon. I'm Amanda Bush, goodbye from Virtual Space TV 3D Show.